Welcome to this week of Missouri Politics from the state capital in Jefferson City. We are taping this on the Thursday before the end of session, and we have four folks with that have been involved in everything, starting with Aaron Baker, behind the scenes on everything in the state with Axiom Strategies. Welcome back to the show. It's good to be here. Senator Holly Rader from down the boot hill in Scott County. Welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. We have Senator Lauren Arthur from the North Land in Kansas City. Welcome back. My pleasure. And we have the Lady of the Hour, Representative Becky Ruth from Jefferson County. Biggest news this week, maybe the biggest news for a long time in state government, has actually moved a, a proposal to improve Missouri roads. Break down what that could actually mean for folks driving 55 right now. Right now, folks driving 55, it's congested. We only have two lanes each way, especially in my district. Um, there are accidents there almost every single day. Um, there have been fatality accidents there. The more people that we have moving to Jefferson County, which population is really kind of exploding there, more homes being built there, um, there's more congestion every single day and people are really frustrated that they're dealing with this and why can't we fix our roads? I hear it time and time again from our my district, my county, why aren't our roads being fixed? We need better roads. We need the infrastructure for our businesses and industry. We have big port projects going on right now within my district. That's going to add more traffic on a road that is already overwhelmed. Yep. So then this is what truly an issue where I think you gotta have both Republicans and Democrats coming together to push this through. I mean, I, I, it looks like maybe the first time the state's actually, you can't waste fraud and abuse your way to building roads. You're gonna have to actually add more money if you want more things. MoDOT has been cut to the bone and I think they've done um, as good a job as anyone could given those circumstances and trying to manage our really expansive system. Um, but it's time that we take a leadership role and make our investments in a long-term project. And um, I was happy to see the House Democrats put that issue over the top. And you, so I watched this, you've sat on that minority side, you show up every day and you <laughs> lose it. It had to be a little tempting, at least it had to cross someone's mind and say, you know what? If the Republicans don't have 82, uh, I'm just going to leave. But they stuck in there and voted, and I, I thought that was average. They had to be at least a little tempted to walk out. Uh, I, I have no idea. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sure no one thought of that. But um, I'm happy that at the end of the day, people came together and did something good for the state. Uh, Senator, we're from a part of the state that we use the roads, and that we use them a lot. And in a lot of ways, this is probably a way that, frankly, St. Louis gives back and Kansas City gives back to the rest of the state by building roads where we can get to St. Louis and Kansas City. This will help where we're from. So it will, um, but I voted against it. And, you know, to me, I think that we're, when, when you have our district, which is in, incredibly poor, and so you have the people who are going to the, the gas station and they're putting in $2 or $4, you know, they're the ones that I feel are paying for this. And so it's been my thoughts from the beginning that we needed to pull back on some of the tax credits that we give um, across the state so pull back on some of the corporate welfare and put it into our roads. And I do agree that MoDOT does a wonderful job and they really have cut back and they've, yeah. they've, they've really, they do a great job with the money that they have and they do need more money. But I think that um, raising our taxes is not the, the way to go. There was a time, maybe, maybe it was to be fair before you got elected, but when you were still involved in the public policy process, Moda, the, the argument was Moda wasn't ran well enough to give them more money. Right. And I thought it was interesting. The arguments I heard against for not passing this was not that Moda is incompetent and can't do it. was, you know, to move from other places, move money around. You don't want to raise a tax. It was very ideological. And it wasn't that Moda is in such a bad shape you couldn't give these people more money, which would have been the argument at some point not long ago. Right. I agree. Absolutely. Aaron, you're from a part of the state that you drive that 63 to get everywhere. It is, a, it is, a, it is something in rural Missouri, if you don't have highways, you, you just, you, not even can't you grow, you can barely live there to start with. That's right. The commuting is very important to our part of the economy. I can understand the concerns coming from both sides of this. I think conservatives were looking for a little more reforms and maybe the way we do roads and bridges, maybe some ideas to privatize some of the services that, that MoDOT provides. But you have to give credit where credit is due to the sponsors and finding innovative ways, see what other states are doing, and add those compromises to try to get Republicans and Democrats to get a bill across the finish line. So it's almost like we're at the, we have the winner's circle on this week. There's something, gosh, how many times have you been on this show 
and we start talking about prescription drug monitoring. This, this week it actually passed both chambers. I think the governor's gonna sign it as quick as he can get his hands on it. This, I mean, regardless of how anybody voted on the issue, there has to be a level of admiration for you taking this issue. This would not have happened had you not fought for it every year, had you not won your Senate race and made this issue come to the front. That had to be, not just you didn't have to feel good, I think everybody in the whole Capitol felt good for you this week. And, you know, and I think that it was a win for all of us, for everyone that's been fighting for it for years, because um, it's a bipartisan issue. It's about families. It's about helping those who are struggling with addiction. It's, it's not about politics. And so for everyone who's been voting for this year after year and have, has watched it fail, so many people on both sides of the aisle have gotten up and during two and three hour debates have gotten up and spoke and spoke and, and been very passionate and told personal stories only to see it fail. And so I, I'm thankful, but I'm excited for all of us that's been fighting for this. It's a team win for sure. So your entire time in this building, you have been discussing this issue, working on this issue, watching it come up, watching it come so close and fail. I, I just think whatever you think about a prescription drug monitoring, I think it's admirable that, that the, the senator has worked on this. And I don't think, had she not done this, this wouldn't have happened. Oh, I completely agree that the handler had so much to do with the eventual passage of the bill. And she set an example for all of us. If you have an issue that you care about, find ways to bring people together, to make it personal, and stick with it year after year <laughs> because um and, and i you know it's a huge credit to her and i think it's a great thing for the entire state i, I kind of felt like now that she was in the senate very different dynamic but there was a trail of friends she had in the house i think that also helped fi finalize and push this across that's where it died last year correct you know and to be honest when it first came out i was not a, a huge supporter of pdmp but she, to her credit, worked very hard, worked with all parties involved to change the bill, to work with the bill, and there were a few changes that got made to the bill that I could support, and I've been a supporter of it ever since. So I appreciate the Senator's hard work on this to make it something that could get across the finish line. Um, I like the fact that it is now more effective um, with the timelines involved in terms of when they check that and that was a big factor for me originally in supporting it and uh, I, I'm happy to have supported it this year. Aaron, you know you get to a unique position these three ladies are in the middle of the fight you're, you're just a hair removed from it but you know it's a theme here it was two folks that passed things that maybe they had to work with the right wing of the party to get it to, to come along and bring this to happen and they did it by compromising and working with folks and it took a while. I have to agree with the supporters that this bill, after many years of, of perfecting... <laughs> uh, it was truly perfection this time. It, it took a while. Right. As, as a Republican, I would rather have Senator Raider's version of a PDMP than Sam Page's version of, of a PDMP that 90% of Missourians were already living under. So I'm very thankful to have this done. If you're running for leadership as a Republican going forward, you're very thankful that this issue is off the table now as well. Talk about another issue that Aaron, it, like we just talk, we've been talking about this issue since, I, since you came on the show the first time ever. Aaron Baker's been talking about school education reform for the whole time I've ever known him. So there's a bill that's heading to the governor's desk. What does it actually do? So ESA program is the scholarship for kids that live in municipalities of 30,000 or more. These scholarships are not vouchers. Vouchers is a direct tax credit to the parents. These are from scholarship entities that get uh, tax credits out to donors. For these kids that live in these districts that feel like their needs aren't being met, this is a way to flee those districts to go to a home school, charter school, uh, private school, or a different public school. Really one of the most innovative ESA programs in the country, and we're going to have it here in, in Missouri. And in a year that's been great for education and reform in the United States, this is one of the most aggressive packages passed. Senator Arthur, I noticed the bill come up in the Senate, and you had Senator Bean make sure all his constituents knew this wouldn't affect them, but then it passed right through. Well, it affects my district, um, and I'll say that I'm disappointed because we've been working on, I'll admit that we've been working on alternate ESA language, and I think our program would have been better. It targeted the neediest students in the worst performing schools. And so I would have liked to have had the opportunity to put forward that proposal instead. Obviously, politics 
governs how we get things done in this building, and um, that was never an our, that wasn't the option before us. And so, um, ESA's passed, and um, I hope going forward next year that we're able to find issues where there really is common ground and that everything passes with a unanimous vote going forward on education. You had to kind of like a house bill just rolling through the Senate with nobody saying a word, right? I mean, that was that's a unique thing from my vantage point. I was amazed by that. I'm obviously on the other side of that. I'm a retired teacher. I spent, you know, 25 years in education and, you know, I did not vote in favor of of the ESAs, but I know you all have worked on that for a long time. It's something that you've tried to get across the finish line and you've come to some compromises and and you at the end of the day you were able to get it done. Feels like that this bill pierced a veil and that maybe now like you see an omnibus bill for different things you might see an omnibus school reform bill. But will you might see one that affects Southeast Missouri where they might not want to be reformed? Well, I think so. And, um, you know, and, and, and when it comes to the ESA bill, one of the things that really hacked me off so much and has for the last nine years is that when it comes to those in, in the education establishment that do most of the lobbying for the, for, against the school reform packages, you know, this bill is for those students that are at risk. It's for I, those with an IP. It looks at those first. And so, you know, last week we had a tax credit bill of 20 million. I didn't get one call on. In the last nine years, I've yet to get a call from anyone in the education establishment that um, is worried about another big tax credit package hitting, hitting the general revenue. But that's the argument with ESAs, is that from, from some in my, in my district, from, my, from the boot hill, um, saying that, hey, this is going to affect the bottom line of general revenue, and so we can't have it. And I'm like, look, if you've not been complaining about all the other tax credits that have been hitting our bottom line, you know, don't call about this one. Um, because it, it is for helping those at risk kids or those with IEPs that are in um, needing to get a, an education somewhere else. But, you know, we have great schools in southeast Missouri, and so I think competition is good, but I don't think that our public schools are going to have to worry about competition when they're doing a good job. Prediction time. Will this be, we'll, we'll be sitting here a year from now talking about another education reform, and will it start to affect rural folks? I think it will. I think we will. I, I don't see education reform going away anytime soon. I think we've seen this for quite a few years now and I think possibly they'll look at trying to do even more with it. Um, one of the things that I would personally like to see is talk to us, talk to the folks that have been in the classroom that have been educators. You know what, there is some reform that needs to be done. But I'd like to see us actually all work together for some reform within our public schools to let teachers get back to teaching and not teaching to a test. Are you going to be filibustering something next year? Something, definitely, <laughs> yes. Aaron Baker would got to know, do you, think, do you think this is a way to maybe try to convince some rural folks that they might, need to be, might not mind being reformed? I agree with Senator Arthur that in the future, I think that uh, it's going to be a more of a scalpel approach and folks are going to focus on schools that are underperforming regardless of where they are. We're going to be right back with these folks and catch them before they have to go back to legislating. But I want to take a second real quick. We lost uh, Senator Dan Brown from Rolla, a legendary person in the state of Missouri. His son serves in the Missouri Senate right now. His funeral service is going to be tonight and tomorrow down in Rolla. He'll be someone that will be missed by everyone. And our thoughts are with his family. We'll be right back after this. All across Missouri, our new car and truck dealers are building strong local economies. When you buy a car or truck in Missouri, you're helping to support over 20,000 Missouri families who rely on the auto industry for good-paying local jobs. You're also helping fund our communities, schools, first responders, and our roads because dealers generate millions of dollars in tax revenue. Missouri's automobile dealers have been the foundation of our communities for generations and for generations to come. The Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, the heart of Missouri. For more than a century, the St. Louis Carpenters Union has shaped our communities. Through trusted alliances, we deliver skilled professional craftspeople, while our business partners provide the kind of quality jobs that keep our economy humming. It's a blueprint that has worked since 1882. Turning Missouri into a right-to-work state stalls progress, wipes out jobs, and kills momentum. Right to work is wrong for everyone. 
Let's keep Missouri moving forward. Visit carpdc.org to learn more. Your energy needs are changing. That's why at Ameren, Missouri, we're not waiting on the future. We're building it with the Smart Energy Plan, advancing thousands of projects across the state, helping reduce emissions through cleaner energy sources, boost reliability with self-healing equipment, and better withstand storms with new composite poles. Moving Missouri forward and bringing us all a little closer together. That's energy at work. Welcome back to Weekend Missouri Politics from the state capital in Jefferson City. We are kept everybody around with us. They might have to duck out, but if they do, you'll just get to see live television in action on Sunday morning. Uh, Representative Becky Ruth from Jefferson County, thank you for sticking around. Great to be here. Thank you Senator for having Lauren me. Lauren Arthur from the Northland. Good Virginia. to be here. Southeast Missouri's own Holly Rader. Yes. And Aaron Baker with Axiom Strategies. Let's talk about Medicaid. So you are the person who probably knows better than many, most folks I know how to go to the ballot, pass something, move a referendum. The folks did it on Medicaid. Now, I think it's an interesting point that when there's a lawsuit over it, they said, yes, we don't have a funding mechanism. But it come, it did pass. Maybe not by a lot, maybe not, but overall it did pass. Mike Parson didn't win everywhere, he's still the governor. Then the legislature said they're not going to fund it. Break me down the, the logical argument not to fund Medicaid. Well, I think the logical argument and not funding is that conservatives are looking for reforms first. And I think whenever you think about things that have passed this session, ESAs, PDMP, gas tax, they've all been a compromise. And so I think conservatives are going to be looking for some major reforms or maybe even minor reforms to Medicaid prior to talking about funding. Senator Arthur, I mean, I, I, I think regardless of your thoughts on Medicaid, it's a darn good argument on any issue when the voters of the state approved it. I agree, and that's the main reason why I support it, in order to uphold the will of the people who went to the ballot and made their voices heard. Um, right now, the ball is in Governor Parsons' court, and it looks like he may have just accelerated the lawsuit with the, his announcement this morning. I mean, that's where this heads, right? You, you basically took this to Will Pearson and Chuck Hatfield will be the ones deciding how this comes out, right? Right. I think we'll see some of this possibly in the courts, you know, and I, I think, as Aaron Baker said earlier, I think there's going to have to be some reforms to that. I, you know, we hear both sides of that argument that we need to expand it, but I also think there needs to be some reforms to that and that we need to make sure that the people that are that need it are the ones getting it. And I think right now we're doing a pretty good job of that in terms of uh, people with disabilities, children with special needs. It's almost like with MoDOT. You had to reform MoDOT some before you could, you could have done what you did 15, 20 years ago. Wouldn't have worked. Right, but since they came out with their Boulder plan, they've made reforms and I think we're seeing that those dollars are being put to good use. So walk me through the minds. Did I send her being this last week? Folks in our neck of the woods, you mentioned before, maybe they don't have the money, folks in other parts of the state do. There are folks that would have qualified, but by the numbers it failed by, there are folks that would have qualified for Medicaid that voted against it. Now walk me through the mindset of folks back home that would be against it even though they would have benefited and qualified for it. Well, because it would have taken money from other services. And so, you know, we, it failed throughout my district almost two to one. And, um, and, and when we talk about the reforms, you know, we're the only state, I believe, in the nation that does uh, payments on top of Medicaid payments for those from out of state that get services mm -hmm. in Missouri. So there are some very important reforms that we need to get done um, that are benefiting other non-Missourians and just that's just one of them. And so I think when it comes to our area, you know, they looked at the in-home care services, they looked at, at, at education, um, our disability services. I think that it was very obvious that uh, something with this type of price tag was going to harm the rest of the budget. It's an interesting mindset though. I mean, you can be conservative here in Chesterfield and you're essentially, you're gonna be paying for health care for somebody else. But in our neck of the woods, some folks that would have actually went to the doctor for free, they don't, they voted against. I think it's an interesting mindset how that's conservative. However you want to slice it, right? Right. Yeah. Let's talk about something <laughs> I know you've been you've been into, Senator. That's uh, it's called Sapa. Explain what that would mean to a regular, just a guy in West Plains that maybe is going to a gun store, watching this on his on on YouTube. What does Sapa actually mean, and what would it do? So the Second Amendment Protection Act, and and what this does is this says that if there are some federal rules that get pushed down or executive orders from the feds, that our state authorities, our state police sheriffs will our tax dollars that pay for their salaries is not going to go to them helping the feds so if 
Biden pushes down a, a an order, red flag order, mm -hmm. or, or whatever. Um, we, our, our state paid officers are not going to be helping those federal officers um, practice those what laws. What if they do? What if they're on the drug task force, like in SEMO? And they, what if they do it? What happens? Well, I mean, you know, in the drug task force, they're just going, first of all, they're going to have to, right now, like bump stock, I think is the only thing that's different between the federal and, and Missouri law. So right now, they're just going to have to not help with confiscating bump stock. Okay. Senator Arthur, I've always wondered this. What happens if they do? Well, I will say apologies if I've ruined many of your shots by checking my phone. I actually have an amendment pending on this bill right now. Um, and it's no surprise that this is a priority of the supermajority, that they want to make it known that they support the Second Amendment. Um, and I... Do you think I, anybody wonders? No. I think they might that many. They won't after this bill. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's. I think it's unconstitutional. I think... I've heard from law enforcement who have concerns over their ability to enforce laws and work with the feds. And um, I'm hopeful that my amendment gets added and then we're ensuring bad guys don't get guns. Well, as you better know in a second, but what, what, happens if, what happens if the cops infest is, what if, if they take someone's bump stock? Do they oh, get sued? You know, at this point, I think the voters of Jefferson County spoke very clearly how they feel about Second Amendment rights and protecting our Second Amendment rights. I'm a co-sponsor of SEPA. I believe in it and I will always defend our Second Amendment rights no matter what. All right, Greg, I'm going to try you. So Republicans ran on, don't defund the police. We're pro-cops. Come January, they come up with an idea, well, let's just sue the cops. I think some of the cops were a little bit whiplashed. What happens if the folks in Atlanta, what if the, what if the Macon uh, County Sheriff confiscates a bump stock? What happens? Well, I think you have some sheriffs that want this to pass and have asked their county commissions to do this. I've never seen an issue at Macon County Lincoln Days where Republicans are coming up to their legislator and they know the difference between a third read on a bill and a perfection vote on a bill and it's all about this gun rights issue. I mean, they are locked in on it. I think Democrats, to be honest with you, think that it'll be thrown out by the courts anyway, so let's just let it pass. And I think Republicans know the grassroots are going to hold them very accountable if they don't get this done. I think there's Democrats that are fine with Republicans voting to sue a cop. Right? Yep, I, I agree. Especially. And you have an amendment on this bill that yeah. I want to ask that, that if, your phone, if she gets up and leaves, it's because she's got this <laughs> amendment up. But tell me what this amendment, this is an interesting part of this. This seems like common sense people come together to prove a point, whatever, if you need to prove a point that you love guns, you can prove a point with this. But also with this, you've got a way to maybe fix something that was unintended from a past session. Yeah, based on some legislation we passed a few years ago, um, it's difficult to ensure that people who are convicted of uh, domestic violence, it's, it's difficult to make sure that they don't have access to firearms. Um, so my amendment would help keep uh, women in those situations safe by making it unlawful for someone who's been convicted of domestic violence from accessing a gun. And that comes from an old law that maybe, at the time I thought folks were saying publicly they would fix this later. Well, later hasn't come until maybe your amendment, right? Right, so I think it's now been six or seven years yeah. where people have talked about this, recognized that it's a problem, and I'm hopeful that now, we'll now fix it Now you can be the old grizzled veteran that says, yeah, I've been around here so long that well, this was it. I'm on a panel with All Stars, so I feel like <laughs> I really need to get something accomplished this year. <laughs> well, we do need it for the cred for the show, so hopefully it'll work by Sunday. Uh, Representative uh, Ruth, let's talk about maybe what you don't get done. Are you going to have to come back to do to spend some of this federal money and do a supplemental budget? I'd like to say I'm hopeful that we could get the FRA done, but if that doesn't get done, we will find ourselves back in a Is special not, session. It has to be done. That's something that maybe not every Republican loves to do, but you do it as part of being a statesman. It seems like the wrong thing to play games with. Right, we need to get the FRA done. I, we're obligated to get that done. It's That's too important. So whether it's now, which day and a half left in session or coming back into a special session. I think it's something that we've got to work on and finish. Senator Rader, are you going to do this in the next day and a half or are you going to have vacation in tropical Jefferson City this summer? Well, I think that there's a, a very high chance that we do have a special because there is a, a really, I mean, when it comes to the, the pro-life language that is, is needed to be added and those for and those against, um, very heated on both sides. And so I'm, um, not so sure we get that done in the next day and a half. 
No, redistricting. That's going to have to be a special session. There's no way around it, right? It's, it's What's going, the process there, Aaron? You know, I, I think the redistricting is, maybe I think it's more simple than it is. We're not losing a congressional district in, in Missouri. Hopefully we can do some of these special session items concurrently uh, because I think that there's not going to be major changes, in my opinion, need to be made to these congressional districts. Interesting. All right, with a minute left, who won the week? Missourians won the week. We got the gas tax done. They're going to have safer roads. They have the option if they want to invest in, in the roads and bridges with Senate Bill 262, they can leave their money there. If not, it's a simple refund, straight money back to them if they want their money back. She, she should have said herself, right? I mean, Senator Arthur, who won the week? Uh, Senate Minority Leader J.J. Rizzo. He has managed to keep our caucus together. We've um, We've been reliable, we've worked collaboratively, and I think a lot of that is thanks to his leadership. A lot of times people obviously criticize the majority when they break the Senate with these PQs, but that's also on the minority. Yeah. That, takes, that takes statesmanship on his part as well. That's right. Who won the week? I think bipartisanship is one of the week. We've gotten yeah. um, multiple things done this week that has been from, from both caucuses. You know, HIV modernization is um, headed to the governor's death. Uh, police reforms, you know, I mean, we've gotten a lot, PDMP, the gas tax. You even tell Shasha you need a bigger it. office for all the shadow boxes from these bills <laughs> you're <growing> up. <laughs> we've gotten a lot done with bipartisanship. Who won the week? So I'm going to say Governor Parson. He's got the most robust education reform bill to pass and in, in, to sign in the country. He's got PDMP to sign. He has his gas tax to pass. He hasn't meddled a lot in the legislative process. But he's got a lot of wins stacked that up. Might be the, the the trick of it is he's gonna have a lot of things that he can go back to people and say got done this year. And while he was involved, it was not publicly, it wasn't heavy handed, and it's kind of worked itself. There was a time when folks were thinking, well, nothing's gonna pass a session, and now there's gonna be a laundry list of bill review for that staff to do starting, I guess, Friday night. That's right, and after COVID, a re an election or re-election, however you want to see it, I mean it was it was a nice time for him to have a, a win. Big and he list did it. of stuff. I'm going to say, Representative Ruth and Dean Blocker, you get to see certain times when a, when a politician or a leader steps up and kind of comes into their own. I think maybe this week was a night for Dean Blocker, the name I think you're going to see on this show and all over the state of Missouri going forward. Hope you'll join us next week with a guy that I think may have one session overall. Senator Brian Williams will be on talking about his police reforms for, back in our St. Louis uh, studios on This Week at Missouri Politics. This Week in Missouri Politics, sponsored by the Missouri Association of Career Fire Protection Districts, Spire, and Sterling Bank. Guys, thank you so much for watching the show. I want to tell you about a new thing we're offering. It's the Missouri Times Podcast Network. You'll get this show every week. If you want to listen to it in your car, you don't have time to watch it. You'll get our show in Missouri podcast, History of Missouri, one county at a time. You'll also get our midweek update. Once a week, I throw up the uh, Facebook Live. I, 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 we talk politics, usually it'll lunch and discuss politics. You'll get to hear all those things come right to your phone. Subscribe to us on iTunes or Android, Missouri Times Podcast Network. Please join us and subscribe.